Hello everyone and welcome back to another episode of the Propulsion Swimming Podcast. I'm your host Scott and with me as always is my trusty co-host Dan. And on this week's show we are speaking to one of American Swimming's brightest personalities, (laughs) Kyle Sockwell. Yeah, we have a very exciting podcast for you guys today. Carl has made a name for himself on social media, especially on, on Twitter and more recently on YouTube. Our chat today will all be about his recently signed deal with USA Swimming to be a content provider on the USA Swimming Network. So we'll be finding out what that actually means and what content he aims to provide over the coming weeks, months or possibly even years. Yes, and on top of that deal, we talk about... The state of swimming right now, how media can grow within the sport and potentially help to grow the sport using community creators like Kyle. So please welcome on to the podcast this week, the self-proclaimed CEO of Swimming Twitter and an intern at Swimming YouTube, (laughs) Kyle Sockwell. Kyle, thank you for coming on to the podcast this week. It has been long overdue that we have a chat with you um, and some very interesting topics to discuss this week. How are things with you? Oh, things are good. Things are good. I mean, yeah, I, I completely agree. Long overdue. But I want to jump right into one thing that okay. I've been premeditating for a little while. Uh-oh. Is the YouTube silver past 100,000 subscriber plaque nearby? I just want to see it. I just, just want to see it so I can get a little bit of inspiration. It's just there, <laughs> hung up on the wall. You have to rely on Scott's editing here. It might just be out of shots, but it's over (laughs) Scott's left shoulder. Yeah. Yeah, I was fired up. I mean, I was fired up when I saw it because, you know, you don't see a lot of those popping up in the community. And it's, you know, if you're a person that watches content on YouTube, that's like, especially, I mean, you go back five, 10 years when 100,000 subscribers was like, because everything's kind of shifting, right? People are starting Mm. to really grow. Mm. And the 100,000 subscriber plaque was like proof right? It was like proof to everybody. Yeah, I yeah, still yeah. think it is. Now you've got like the 10 million, the 100 million, like whatever. But <laughs> seeing that and every time I think, you know, it's a good indicator of the way that the sport is progressing. So I saw that I got fired up. So first of all, forget about me. Congratulations from another content creator in the space who's trying to eventually get one of those silver ones. Congrats, y'all. <laughs> oh, oh, you're very kind. It. It's, uh, I still think subscribers is a little bit of like a vanity metric oh for sure i don't know Mm. quite how it does for content on youtube right now but that's that's like a whole different conversation Mm. um yeah but but we need vanity right we need we need a little bit of vanity to keep ourselves going it's uh (laughs) it's a tough world it's a world that can beat you down and you know it's easy to get burnt out so yeah send me a a silver rectangle of is it made out of metal is it like does it have some weight to it Uh, it's it's like um clad in metal so it's like metal overlay Okay. It's yeah, that works. Heavy, yeah, yeah, sure. It could be made out of wood and painted silver. <laughs> <laughs> it certainly helped with the egos, I think. Don't you think? So yeah. Yeah. Just yeah. Oh yeah. It. But <laughs> yeah, and I mean, swimming. Yeah, we're in the the day and age of you know people still looking at a subscriber count or a follower count, and I think it, it's kind of fair. It's a piece of you know the puzzle of trying to find you know legitimacy behind people that are talking into a microphone or people that are tweeting stuff out on the internet like i still remember the first time i got my verified badge back when it wasn't you know something you paid for on twitter and it it was like a okay i think like things are starting to become real like this is starting to become a real thing like it started to it really validated my excited this whole opinion of myself where i was like i'm just a guy that tweets stuff out like whatever i'm just a guy i'm just an idiot or whatever and you know, people for a long time told me like, no, people are following you for a reason. People, this is happening for a reason. And that was sort of like a check yourself moment. Things are like happening because of the work that you're putting in, not just because you're an idiot and you just fell onto the internet and it started happening. But yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm eventually, I'm going to put it right here. I'm going to have it like right here, maybe like suspended <laughs> hanging from my ceiling over my head. <laughs> we'll see. Proper like Spotlights on it. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I might just like wear it <laughs> on top of my head. We'll see. I don't know. Oh, it's really interesting. Like the the whole premise of this conversation is going to be around like how community can push swimming forward. And mm. yes, we we say it's like a vanity metric, but the more maybe sponsors can see that there's these numbers, and that is a like open number that people can see. We can't make that up. We can't put mm. it in front of them. It's there. The more that sponsors see that there are these eyes on this sport. Like yes, it's a niche, and it is a niche which shoots itself in the foot a lot of the time when it comes to viewing figures. Both feet. But, well, exactly. <laughs> but 
there are people interested in it and it mm. is finding growth in the day and age of social media which i think has a massive part to play in sport right now um and yep. yeah it's it's more the independent creators like yourself like us which are pushing the sport forward to a new level which is really exciting um now we we could dive down that rabbit hole straight away <laughs> but i, w- I want to know how kyle sockwell got to this point got to this point in the journey of 40 almost 50,000 subscribers on Twitter what was your journey like through swimming like how did you get to here yeah I, I like to call it a, um, a collection of accidents and you know people talk about making your own luck and, and you know this and that but do you guys remember vine yes yeah, yeah, yeah. so so vine was kind of the the thing that kicked me off um, okay. I was swimming at Arizona State this was pre Bowman, I think. He ended up coming in and had to deal with my shenanigans, um, you know, once he got hired. But I just decided to kind of mess around on deck and, and make some, like, I, I call it like really trash content, just like the lowest hanging fruit. Basically, you take something that you would say to your lane mate in practice. I would film myself and then I would film myself from another angle because at the, you know, initial launch of Vine, you couldn't do like a lot of the editing, right? Mm-hmm. It was a, push record, whatever your phone sees, you have to do like some movie magic. And that's where, you know, if you don't know Zach King, um, the people listening, it's like a, he he did like magic, but only using his phone. And so it was Mm -hmm. like this thing where you could like, you would see him doing something and you would be like, it doesn't make sense that he's able to do that thing. It doesn't make sense that he's able to like do magic when he can only just push record, push record again. And then all of a sudden he did this magic trick, right? And so I started off just doing that and trying to figure out how to game like the vine system and figure out how to game like just that whole thing and like get loops and and continue that Mm. forward. And, you know, it started to catch a little bit of steam and then vine imploded. It got bought by Twitter and Twitter kind of ran it into the ground. But luckily I could kind of see that coming and vine still existed, you know, in parallel with Twitter. And so I just started to kind of run over there and create the same kind of content and just do, oh, I mean, like, you know, tweeting stuff like when your lane mate does this and, you know, attach a photo or a meme, I guess you could say. I feel old for not remembering what the word meme is. But so I started doing like very (laughs) meme driven content and just like the really low hanging fruit just to kind of, I think it was more of a litmus test to see, you know, if this was something that people were going to be interested in. And over time, you know, I, I started to dabble a little bit more in, you know, stuff that wasn't as low hanging and started experimenting with like news. And, you know, once I was removed from college swimming, I started talking about, you know, predominantly NCAA swimming because there wasn't like a huge interest from media in like live content surrounding like NCAA swimming. And so that's when it really started to grow. And it was a, I mean, it was a grind. If you go to my Twitter account, you'll see that I follow like 11,000 people. And it was because I would sit there and just follow people that were swimmers. Mm -hmm. Right after I would put out a piece of content and then I would just follow a ton of people, just a ton of people. I followed like 11,000 people or something like that. Now I don't do that as much because I don't have the time, nor do I have the the hand strength to sit there and tap that many (laughs) times um, or the focus of like a kid that is, trying to see if he can make it in a world that really doesn't have or hasn't had him before. And so, yeah, I mean, it was just a grind and there was really no moment, (laughs) which is the thing that, you know, a lot of people, especially coming into like a career that's like as creative and as there's definitely potential for a moment in time where you like, Mm. I did it, I made it, you know, this explosive growth here and there. It was just, pretty stagnant. It was just a growth thing. Like it was a a straight line, (laughs) just like slow growth. And obviously like during the Olympics and, you know, world championships and NCAAs and stuff like that, there's going to be like little peaks and then there'll be, you know, valleys. Our sport has, unfortunately, I think more valleys than peaks. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was, (laughs) it was a grind, but it started on vine and now we're on YouTube. Now we're doing Instead of six and a half second content, we're doing like an hour and 15 minute content Mm. with guys like Rowdy Gaines, which still blows my mind. Yeah, that was an an amazing podcast, actually. We'd love to get Rowdy on just because, you know, 
I, I, we see you tweet a lot about that, you know, the Beijing relay, and I think everyone who used to be a swimmer or is a swimmer should know about that relay, obviously, and the fact that you get to speak with him. Um, guys, trying to put it into words of how amazing that moment was, and it's that's that sort of content that actually needs to go out to the masses because that's what swimming can be. And I think that we're, we're going to see more stuff like that because, you know, these records are getting quicker and quicker. The more superstars are coming on the stage more and more. And it's people like us, I suppose, the independent sort of creators that need to be involved in it. Um, I don't know if you agree with that, but I don't know if more people will eventually get involved because, of, let's say, this success that we're starting to see. Yeah, I, I think you're 100% right. Uh, that was that was still a moment that, um, and I had talked to Rowdy a lot just through like DMs and it, it on on Twitter, and it just like started to become this weird thing where I was like, you know, I I feel like I could just reach out to Rowdy and he would say yes, and so I just mm-hmm. DM'd him and almost immediately he was like, yeah, say say when, whenever, oh, wow. and he came on and yeah, that conversation was, I mean, when he started it off by like giving me props on what I was doing, I was like, it was kind of a, a validating moment of like, all right, I need to give myself a little bit of credit because I don't know if you guys are the same way. It's, it's so easy to get lost in like, I want to get to this point. I want to get here. I'm not doing enough. Mm-hmm. I'm not creating enough. And for, you know, someone of, you know, a guy that I listened to during easily the biggest moment in our sport in 2008, the Beijing Olympics, calling all those races as a kid at home, holding onto mm-hmm. a pillow during that 2008 Beijing 400 freestyle relay, the relay you were referencing and throwing it in the air as Rowdy and Dan Hicks hit, go nuts. And I get yelled at by my mom because I threw it and it hit the ceiling fan, almost broke the ceiling fan. It's like such a core memory just burned into my brain. And then to be able mm-hmm. to sit there and like, I mean, he's, he's seriously has said, just like reach out whenever I'll, I'll come back on at any point in time. And to your point about, you know, independent media and what we're doing, um, I've had a lot of time to sit and think about that exact thing um, and whether it's a good thing or a bad thing or doing it out of order. And I think it's absolutely a good thing. Um, If you look at a lot of the big sports and compare them to swimming, we're missing out on what I call layers. We're missing out on a lot of layers of media. So you have like an NBC that does, you know, the Olympics, it does Olympic trials, it does world championships, it does all of the really big stuff. And they create some content around it, but at the same time, you know, it's once a year. And for them, it's not something that's going to pull the numbers of a, you know, NFL game. It's not something that's going to pull the numbers of, you know, any huge number of other sports, right? So it's not Mm going to be their focus. And we get kind of wrapped up in feeling targeted, like, oh, like you guys don't give us any, any credit. You got, you're not helping build the sport. And we had a conversation at the beginning of the show. We have to prove that they should. Right. It's we get this whole thing out of order where, you know, NBC is a business. You're not talking to the CEO of NBC unless you're a very privileged person that is able to, you know, text the CEO of NBC and be like, you should cover swimming. You don't get to do that. The way that you get to that person is you have someone 16 prongs below him say, oh, wow, there was actually some pretty good viewership on the, you know, U.S. World Championship swimming trials maybe we should throw a little bit of money behind it and just see if it turns into something. And then all of a sudden it might work. And then you can get two steps higher. You can get two steps higher. Then all of a sudden, you know, they could get experimental. They could, you know, start following around these athletes. We get like a drive to survive, like F1 series. I don't know if y'all have seen that. Mm -hmm. There's so many layers between NBC and like a swim swam, right? Swim swam does an incredible job with just giving you everything every single thing they possibly can. They've got a huge network of writers. If you want to know what's going on in swimming, and I don't want to endorse anybody too much on someone else's podcast, you can click on their site and they've got a ton of stuff on there, right? Mm. But the gap between NBC and being able to go to Swim Swam and be like, this is what's happening. We're missing out on literally all of the entertainment, (laughs) right? If you go look at any other sport, everything in the middle is everything that drives that sport, that drives that engagement, that athlete engagement, that fan engagement. And right now all we have is people that are currently participating in the sport or people that currently have skin in the game, aka a, a kid swimming or a brother or you know a, a nephew or something like that, aka family and friends, and then people that are swimming, young kids. Those are the fans, that's your fan base. 
And until you get people that graduate from the sport, we we'll call it graduating, like, like myself, if I wasn't doing this, would I be watching swimming? It's a real, I mean, I'm, I'm a fan of the sport and I, I probably would be, but at the same time, I don't think I would be anywhere near as engaged as I am right now. Um, obviously I am highly engaged right now, but those layers that are missing in the middle of the sport, I think are the reason that I would not be able to engage. So what you're saying is like the community that is being built from independent creators and even swimmers themselves is literally the driving force between it's almost between Olympic cycles as dumb as that sounds, but that is between the big NBC productions. That is what's keeping the audience around. Yeah. A hundred percent. Um, you know, if you think about the Super Bowl, for example, like that's, that's the big event in American football. It is the, I mean, I don't really have like a huge desire to go to it, but for most of America, that is like where you want to eventually get to go. It's really expensive. It's a big production. And more often than not, people don't even totally care about what teams are playing. <laughs> they just want to go watch because it is the Super Bowl. But what drives all of that is the NCAA market in, in the States for football is unbelievably big, unbelievably big. You can go all the way to D2, D3. You can go to you know high school games. I live in Texas. I don't know if you guys know what or have heard of Friday Night Lights, yeah, but it is this yeah. series. I mean, it, it's huge. Everybody knows about it, especially everybody in America. Anybody that knows football knows about Friday Night Lights, which is about a high school football team, right? High school football, mm -hmm. which on a Friday night, any given Friday night in America, there are going to be five times as many people at a high school football game as there would be at the biggest NCAA swimming dual meet in the country mm -hmm. between guys like Leo Marchand could be there, you know, at an ASU dual meet, you could have it for two of the biggest teams going head to head at a great facility and a high school football game in the States would be outperforming you. And it's because not necessarily only because of the layers, I think American football and soccer, and they're, they're definitely better set up for a viewer experience, mm -hmm. but at the same time, you have all of those layers in mm -hmm. swimming. We try the ISL. We don't have a professional league. Mm -hmm. Once you graduate from high school, if you're good enough, you can go swim in college. If not, then maybe go pro and make like $7 a month trying to <laughs> chase some crazy dream. And, you know, I've talked to a bunch of swimmers about this. And the craziest thing, the one that I always point out is the biggest problem in our sport, I think, is that the difference between second place and third place at a u.s olympic trials if we say second place qualifies for a team third place doesn't is that second place can make a career out of the sport now and third place third place has no shot if we can't solve that dilemma yeah. i mean it is and then we're like well why do people have mental health problems in swimming <laughs> well you have four years to prepare for one chance and then you could miss out on not from like making a million dollars in the sport and making a hundred thousand dollars in the sport from making, you know, a decent living. If you know what to do and you like can market yourself and actually put some effort forth. If you have the, the Olympic ranks tattooed on you for swimming in the United States, you absolutely can figure out how to make money in the sport. Absolutely mm -hmm. can. If you don't, it becomes exponentially harder because saying you made a world championship team to anybody, you know, you're going to get 3% of people that know what you're talking about. That's the problem. If you take away the Olympics, swimming just doesn't matter to the masses. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how we make the world, because the world's is a second place by a long distance in terms of uh, prestige on the international stage. Swimming is known as a once every four year sport, but we've got to try and change that because currently at the moment, worlds is happening every year. But how do we make worlds <laughs> bigger? We, you know, do how do we, we make Europeans it, bigger? Though? Do we have to change it? So if you say the Olympics is the pinnacle, what if you mm. just made what's below it professional and marketable? That might be the difference of keeping people in the sport because you're saying if you don't get first or second, you're, you're broke. But what if you kept people in the sport by making a professional league around the world, making a US professional league, making a British professional league where you make it so marketable that sponsors actually want to put money towards it? Because there are meets around the world which pay decent amounts to swimmers i would say mm. like the world cup that's going on right now if you are the top swimmer of that weekend it's like 12 grand that's a good yeah, amount of money for a swimmer it's not bad, not bad for a yeah. weekend yeah yeah exactly <laughs> yeah. Yeah. um yes when there's swimmers getting very close to world records those are the ones who are going to be walking away with the money but if you make leagues and 
inherently marketability in swimming if we get that mm. right maybe that means that swimming doesn't have to change from being a once every four years but people can survive yeah i think the professional league thing is something that i think about probably way too often i probably think about it every day within 30 minutes of waking up um <laughs> it's it's something that i just i don't understand how it hasn't worked and there was a moment that literally incepted this for me um I, so I live in Austin, Texas. It's, you know, Texas. When you, when you think of America and you think of Texas, you think I'm, I'm on a ranch right now. You think there should be a cow <laughs> behind me and there is. So I'm, I'm the, the general Texan, right? And so it won't surprise you when I say that I went to a PBR, which is professional bull riding, team bull riding event in the biggest, you know, event center in Austin. I went there not knowing really what to expect. You know, if you've been to a rodeo or seen a rodeo on TV, if you've seen a rodeo on TV, honestly, it's probably a pretty decent depiction of what a rodeo is. It's really not that difficult to depict. You just get a bunch of guys in cowboy hats and jeans and then throw a couple, you know, bull riders into a ring and, and that's what you get. You know, you get people scores. And so I went into it and I was like, whatever, you know, we'll just, we'll see what this is. It was the coolest event I've probably ever been to. Bull riding. Okay. I had no idea how it was scored going into it. Absolutely no idea. But I know that the lights went off, the music came on, they had floor seating. And then out of nowhere, they come out and light the ground. And they had laid out like, I don't know what it was. It was something flammable, like gunpowder or something. And they burned, it was just like on fire, the PBR logo. And I was like, all right, wait a minute. <laughs> this might be something that I enjoy. They individually introduce all of the bull riders. They've got like six different teams. So there's six teams and three different, like technically dual meets happening. So four of the teams go back, two teams come out. They have their own little section. They have their own, you know, animals that they're riding and they come out, they introduce everybody. They got, you know, like a rodeo clown that's inter like uh, entertaining people in between people riding bulls. And I was just like, so overwhelmed in the best way possible because I looked at it and I was like, they're entertaining. You know, they took a sport that only mattered to a very small subset of people that understood like the ranch life, right? Mm. Or people that were tourists and <laughs> were coming through like a small Texas town and they were like, there's a rodeo in town. Like, yeah, I'm going to go buy a cowboy hat from the gas station, walk out there and try not to look like a poser. Well, if you've done that, everybody knew that you were faking it. It's very easy to tell. <laughs> but at the same time, I sat up there and I was like, when is this happening again? I missed it this year because I was out of town. But if it's back in town next year and I'm here, I will pay 200 US dollars to go sit in seats and watch this thing again because I was entertained. And that's mm -hmm. the big thing is in swimming, we for some reason forget that we're in the business of entertainment and we focus on what time happens when you hit the wall and that's it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's so we don't yeah. have a score <laughs> on the board pretty much ever for NCAA meets, which blows my mind that we have people come sit in the stands and they're like, what's going on? <laughs> like everyone's re really excited, but I have no idea what the score is on a live stream. I don't think I've ever seen a live stream with the dual meet scoring on it. They just leave it off because mm -hmm. I don't, either we don't know where to put it or we just think it don't, doesn't matter. Right? So it's, it really feels like a product issue. And the reason that we haven't figured out our product yet is because we're not even willing to implement like a three point line in basketball, because believe it or not, that is a significant change to basketball that I think made the sport better. And way back in the day, everything was a two pointer. Mm -hmm. We need to, we need to figure out our three point line. We need to figure out our free throws. We need to figure out a ton of different things. And you know, more than that, I just think we need to just try, we need to try mm -hmm. something. I think ISL got so close. That's so what I was going to bring that up. In. Yeah. The spectacle, the perfect, but then the points got overcomplicated. The results yeah. got overcomplicated. I, yeah, I couldn't understand any of it. And yeah. the pay was, I will say, too high that no one actually got paid. Yeah, agreed. Yeah, there were there were some issues that I think for people that understand general business and also understand swimming and have those two, you know, brain sets and could combine their powers or whatever that you could see from the outside looking in pretty clearly. Mm -hmm. And 
one of the points that you brought up, Scott, was doing a league in the U.S. and doing a league in Britain. Mm. And you are so spot on because I think one of the biggest issues with the ISL was we went, all right, we're going to take a team from the UK and we're going to fly them to LA and then we're going to fly them to Germany and then we're going to fly them over here. All the time zones were insane. I never knew when anything was happening. And also mm. you're making your athletes spend, I mean, full days on mm. planes, full days. And so if you think about the U S right, you have, you, we had the LA current, we had, we'll say we had the Austin rodeo and we had the New York, uh, wall street guys. Okay. So you've got those three teams, New York, LA, Austin in each, you know, area of the U S because you have West coast, central and, and East coast. Mm. If those teams only swim two meets in town throughout the entire season, there, there, you have no opportunity for those teams to see and be a part of that, right? You have no opportunity for your core fans to really engage with your, you know, your sport. And the same thing happens with the NCAA. And I think the NCAA is a, a huge like thing that could really start vibrating and explode out into other regions of swimming that could end up making money. And if you have say, we'll say the Austin rodeo is an NCAA team now. So hopefully people are keeping up with my insane mind. <laughs> um, so the Austin rodeo NCAA team is, you know, a team based in Austin and we swim eight dual meets throughout the year, a conference meet and invited NCAAs, those eight dual meets. We're not going to suit up. We're not going to suit up. We're going to have them at 11 AM on a Friday. Well, okay. So I can't go to any of those dual meets throughout the year. So that sucks. But you know, maybe I can go to the invite. Oh, sorry. The invite is actually in Indiana. Oh, well, all right. I'm not going to fly to the invite to see a team that I, you know, still can't even see, even though I live in your city. Well, where's NCAAs? Oh, NCAAs is actually in Minnesota this year. And then next year it's gonna be in California. And then after that, it's going to be in Arizona. And it's just, it's impossible. You know, it's impossible to become a fan of a team, not because it's not exciting, but not it's because we don't give people an opportunity. We're not presenting them the right product and we're not presenting it at the right time at the right place. We're doing like pretty much everything wrong. <laughs> it's, I wouldn't I know how you it's, begin. Al it's almost, sorry, it's almost set up as if it's American football and it's the Super Bowl and everyone knows what's going on and you have an in inherently the whole population of America as your audience. Maybe it needs to set up and sit back and say, okay, we're swimming. We are swimming. We need to market ourselves as a small time sport which is hard for a lot of people to hear but then you grow you don't take away your audience which actually swimming has a massive benefit in the fact that every year a kid learns to swim you get a new audience a new generation consistently it's not hard you don't have to try to get a new audience but you lose an audience oh yeah Real quick too. Yeah. And I mean, mm. it, it, it's so, you know, track I think is doing a really good job. They're doing a really good job trying stuff. The diamond league is killing it. Um, you know, their media layers are developing really quickly and their media layers are doing a really good job of, and I mean, if you, you guys know how CPMs and RPMs, which is how you calculate how much money you make on YouTube, you know how those work and you know that you can go look at a channel and say, all right, that's a nine minute video that got 500,000 views on it. It made some good money off of that video, mm. like good money. And so if you go look at, you know, a, tr a track channel that's doing commentary and you see, oh wow. Okay. So they're releasing four videos a week and they're averaging 180,000 views. That's not like a hobby. That's a legitimate mm. career, like a good <laughs> career. And it's, it's happening in track. And so when you have that start to develop, right? Track is set up the same way we are. They were in every four year sports. They, they implemented the diamond league. You know, people are starting to get a little bit more exciting. People are starting to show up at events. Their media layers are developing and we're just kind of sitting over here like, Oh, okay. Yeah. That, cool. Right. Mm. So, I mean, not to go back to our original conversation, but you develop those middle layers, right? And then once those middle layers of engagement and interest start to develop, I really think you're absolutely right. Start small. Mm -hmm. I, I think the ISL tried to be the NFL immediately. 
And I think we threw a ton of money and excitement at it and said, all right, let's give it three years. If we get three years out of it and it doesn't work, dang, like we, we tried. And so we started throwing bells and whistles at it and trying to like, you know, put band-aids on, you know, building an actual audience and start domestic, start small. I guarantee you, if you said, Hey, we've got a, cause what is the NFL? Like 20 weeks. So it's a, a third of the year. We've got a 14 week season. You're going to swim 10 meets. You get four bye weeks, right? That's, that's the entire season. And we'll pay you 20 grand to be on the team as an athlete. You're like, okay, so I get to stay in shape, make 20 grand, get to be on a team again, which is the thing that like people don't really understand is when you graduate from NCAA swimming and you're like, okay, so now I can go swim by myself and compete once every four years for a team again, Mm -hmm. that rocks your world. That turns your world upside down because you're training with the team all wearing the same cap, going to dual meets, yelling at each other. And they're really exciting team to team, no matter who you are for fans. It's a little confusing, but when you jump ship from that to going, all right, back to, you know, club swimming again, kind of, and there's no professional environment. Yeah. It's so hard to make people want to do that. So yeah, start small, let those media Mm -hmm. or media layers develop and also just don't make people fly across the country (laughs) i we so if you think about like baseball right japan has a really good baseball system really good baseball over there shohei otani incredible baseball player he came over to the u.s played i think potentially one of the best baseball players of all time they have their own ecosystem not every single one of their players comes over to the states and plays in the ncaa or plays in the mlb and so they have their own full you know, farm system. We have our own farm system over here. It doesn't have to be, you know, we're going to go all over the place. We're going to have the world baseball league and make it really logistically complicated for our fans to watch the sport. Right? Like we wouldn't do that. Right. I wouldn't have to wake up at 2 AM to watch like a world championships. That would be insane. I did. I do often. (laughs) Right. And I think, you know, just keeping it domestic, keeping it small, letting those media layers develop and You don't have to offer swimmers a ton of money. Just offer them the experience and the ability to make some money on their sport when they Mm -hmm. graduate, quote unquote, from college and people are going to jump all over it. I mean, Austin Mm -hmm. Rodeo, make it happen. I'll be at every meet. I'll buy a suite once the YouTube revenue starts hitting a little harder (laughs) and (laughs) we'll be off to the races. It's but you're right. I think, Dan, I think you brought this up. It's a complex situation and it can all it feels like a where do you start situation and i have no idea (laughs) i think we're we're quite keen on linking uh elite swimming to the grassroots and trying to get people involved in that sort of respects and then i don't know obviously we've spoken about the former on behind uh drive to survive i think that needs to also happen to then get behind the scenes of you know you see adam pc yes he hit an amazing world record but how did he get to that point? Or, you know, how did Duncan become our most decorated swimmer in this country? How did he get to that point? It's great. You, you see him do his 200 IM. Amazing. But, you know, we want to see him go through the blood, sweat and tears in the training pool and stuff like that. Um, and it's, it, yeah, trying to link it so that everyone can see that from your club swimmers right the way through to age group youth and all that sort of stuff. I think that's what we're, that's what we're trying to strive for over here, I think. Yeah, it's coming back to these layers that you've been talking about. It's, it is it's coming layers, a full yeah. circle of conversation. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, and I, I, can't, I can't stop thinking about a professional league, and I can't stop thinking about the fact that we just don't have enough layers. <laughs> Those mm. are the two things that keep me up at night and wake me up in the morning. And the thing that you brought up, Dan, again, about the drive to survive thing, and mm. how great of a content piece it would be for sure for fans. Oh, it would be incredible, but also it would be a hugely beneficial piece of content to put out there for athletes and for young athletes to see Adam Peaty break down completely after a training session and just be completely out of it and over the sport and done and then come back three days later later refreshed and have a kid watch that and go damn I I feel like that sometimes I I feel like human yeah Yeah. for some godforsaken reason swimmers love to be just completely iron shielded 
completely. Mm. And we've done it to ourselves over the course of the history of our sport. We've built it up as this thing where you're not allowed to show any emotion other than excitement. And if you get too excited, mm. you, you're too excited, cut it out. And it's, it's yeah. the worst possible thing we can do for athletes and also for fans. If you're a fan sitting at home and you have an athlete that just accomplished their dreams and they're sitting there and they're like, don't be too excited. <laughs> Make sure you shake the hand of the person to your left and the person to your right. And then you weren't supposed to get up on the lane rope as a kid. So don't do that. You're sitting there mm. calculating all of these things so you don't get in trouble. Meanwhile, if you were just yourself, you could officially be congratulated as the first swimmer to officially completely be themselves. And <laughs> you will be hailed as a hero. <laughs> like, it, it's so frustrating. And I went through it, right? I mean, mm. I, I talk, and I think I put out a video on my channel where I talked about it openly. And I was like, I wish I had celebrated more. I wish mm. I had like released that emotion more. I did it like one time. One time I dropped like four seconds in a 200 brushstroke at our NCAA championships and solidified a place to score for our team. So scoring for the team at the Pac-12 championships, and I turned around and was like on the water. <laughs> that was it. And I remember <laughs> thinking like, oh no, like was that too much? And I just hate, I hate that we have built ourselves into this sport of people that are like, afraid to show emotion afraid mm. to just like be themselves because and it's, it's really hard to like fault anybody for it i think it's just a thing that has happened over time but mm. it's because we don't get to see those athletes in their truest form and, and personality just being yeah. okay with it being okay with being a little bit vulnerable and being you know broken down at one point you know i saw adam's interview after i think it was his 50 breast at the world cup um mm. in berlin mm. and he was like pretty open and honest and it made the rounds on the internet immediately yeah. and it really didn't even feel like he was really like we weren't behind the scenes seeing adam like really like break down and be like like can i keep doing this and the mm -hmm. fact that like we don't get to see that and the fact that you know some people might think the can i keep doing this attitude is not okay is terrible <laughs> you know our sport shoves our heads underwater we don't get to talk to anybody and we stare at a black line. We talk about it all the time and we love to self-deprecate because I think it's a self-soothing thing that we do. And then when you show emotion, we shun you. And mm. if anyone's listening to this, especially the young swimmers, show emotion. If anyone tells you not to, within reason, obviously, don't, don't go completely crazy. <laughs> <laughs> show emotion, be exciting, be yourself. And if anyone tells you not to, it's probably not the right person to be being a leader for you or a mentor for you because we're the only sport that doesn't do it. If you watch mm -hmm. football, I'm talking about soccer in this instance. If you watch football, if you watch cricket, if you watch any other sport, people show emotion, people are fun, people are exciting, and fans like it, parents like it, and especially the athletes. So, mm. yeah, we've got some problems in our sport. <laughs> do you know, I, I think the tide is turning. Like from mine and Dan doing this for what four years now, I think it's turning. So we we this summer we did we filmed an English summers, which is like the step below the top one in this country, and there were people sitting on lane ropes galore. They were loving it mm. because it was on a live stream, and they knew like Meme National Center was going to pick it up and put it on their social. <laughs> they loved it. They loved every second about it, and then. Beyond that, me and Dan now have built quite a good relationship with a lot of the British swimmers, and we know their personalities, and they are there. Like, there are some amazing personalities in that squad that maybe the actual governing bodies aren't willing to put forward just because maybe it's slightly risky. I don't know. But then me and Dan see it and we're like, right, I know who to film at this meet behind the scenes because they're going to give a wink to me behind the block. <laughs> like, I know they will spot the camera and they will smile, they will wave, and you will get that. And we know which ones are comfortable with us filming them when they're nervous. And I think it's there. It really is there. It's about building trust with the swimmers. I was going to say trust. It's, yeah. it's the trust with the swimmers to get it out. And some media cameraman from World Aquatics isn't going to build that trust. Yeah, and it's mm. because that media person and that cameraman is on his sixth sport of the week, right? Yeah. Mm. And we don't, we don't have the typically. And, I, and so Elizabeth Beisel does a lot of the sideline reporting and questions and stuff like that for some of the higher level NCAA meets in the States. 
and you notice every time she does it, those swimmers grew up watching her. Those swimmers know who she is and they know that she's one of them, right? She's a swimmer. She's been in that position. And so you notice that even if Elizabeth doesn't ask a groundbreaking question, which I don't think you should be, right? (laughs) Someone just got out of a race. They're going through a world of emotions. You don't need to ask them like a quantitative physics question and see if they get it right. Granted, that would Mm. maybe be a pretty sweet piece of content, (laughs) especially if they're a physics major or something. But you don't have to do anything too crazy. And they give Elizabeth a much more animated answer, a much more real Mm. answer. And... Yeah, I I agree 100% on the personality side of things. I've mentioned it in a few of my videos. Some of the junior national team kids from the U.S. have some big personalities. Yeah, you see it. And I think, you know, I I don't think that's a new thing. I think them being willing to just show it a little bit more. Because I grew up around a lot of the national teamers that are, you know, now that I'm a little bit older, they're just like my regular friends. (laughs) But I know a lot of them behind closed doors and they are exciting. They are just like any other professional athlete and they have loud personalities, but there's Mm -hmm. that barrier between is this okay and is it not? And you bring up the, you know, the governing body thing. I think we put a lot of pressure on a USA Swimming or a British swimming, or, you know, a lot of these governing bodies to wear every single hat that a sport needs them to wear. If you think of, um, I don't know, let's go with USA basketball or the NBA. Those two roles are completely different. Mm. And no one on the US basketball team is going to get paid $5 million to play (laughs) for Team USA. But the Charlotte Hornets. I think it's the Hornets. I don't know why I picked them. I could have gone with San Antonio Spurs way closer to home and protected (laughs) myself there. But the San Antonio Spurs are going to pay you $20 million a year. Mm -hmm. And so you go play for your country, you make 50 grand playing for, you know, USA basketball, and you're not doing it for the money because the Charlotte Hornets are paying you $50 million over the course of three years or whatever. And so if you think about that in swimming, we put all the pressure on USA Swimming, speaking for the, the US and knowing all of these, you know, people from the highest level swimmers all the way down to people that swam, you know, D3, not that there's anything wrong with that, but never touch the professional environment. And all of them kind of have the same opinion. Typically, it's like a USA Swimming should be doing more. And my opinion was the same for a while, kind of like segueing into talking about USA Swimming and governing bodies mm-hmm. was that. USA Swimming should be doing more. Why aren't they doing more? Why is NBC promoting this? Why aren't they doing this? Why aren't they doing that? And then you take a step back and you look at every other professional sport. I like, it was hard for me to like say USA basketball, US basketball, because it's like not something that I ever think about. But the NBA is all over my TV. It's all over the, like my social, everything. Everything. It's not the governing body pushing it forwards. Exactly. Because the governing body has a, million other responsibilities to take care of, right? They have their U S national team. They have the team that they're trying to prep for the Olympics, but it's, Mm. is it USA swimming's responsibility to make sure these athletes are getting buku bucks? No, not necessarily. It's, It's, it's their responsibility to make sure that the events are able to go on and the events get bigger. It's Mm. their job to make sure that we have enough corporate sponsors to be able to go to Lucas oil stadium and fill that stadium, which we can talk about that if we want to. The tickets are very expensive for U.S. Olympic trials. <laughs> very expensive. Um, but it's their job to do that. It's mm. not their job to go, all right, we'll set up the professional league under the USA Swimming umbrella. Because nobody wants that anyway. If they started mm. to do that and they had control over the NFL and U.S. football, right? You don't want that. They have all the control. They can control Mm. your salary. They can control the entire sport, the rules, everything, and no one has a say. So you have the U.S. Golf Association and the PGA Tour. No one is yelling at the U.S. Golf Association because the purse at the the Masters wasn't big enough. They're yelling at Mm. the Masters and they're yelling at the PGA Tour because that's what they do. So. Mm. Layers, I think that it? is a huge issue in our sport. <laughs> Literally is the layers that have built in those sports and we just don't have it. So where then, 
with all this, does your deal with USA Swimming come into it? What is going on in that sense in terms of content creation, pushing it out? What do, yeah, what, like, explain it to people because some people might not have seen it. Yeah, so um, I'll tell you everything I can without getting into too many details that I get an email or get in trouble. <laughs> um, so, I mean, I've done every single thing on my channel that has, you know, gone out from someone that would manage the channel. Obviously, like I have a bunch of people that have supported me and helped me and come onto the show and, you know, recommended me, you know, certain pieces of content to put out and develop relationships between me and athletes and, you know, help be like a liaison. But everything that you see going out, the editing, the thumbnails, the, you know, scheduling, every single thing is done by me, every single thing. And it's, it's hard. <laughs> it's really hard. <laughs> and especially when like YouTube is, YouTube and sometimes they just decide to do things. And, you know, if you get demonetized, that's two, two months of salary that are gone. And so dealing with that and like trying to deal with burnout and doing this and doing that, it's difficult. And so during the demonetization period, which YouTube did, um, I had like 60 days where I wasn't getting paid a dollar and it was during the NCAA championships. So it was during the biggest moment in my channels and I did the math and it would have been like, that moment where I would have been like, this is possible. Like mm. I I'm not making a full-time salary off of this for sure, but this is possible. And I had to sit there and kind of do the math and go like, Oh, I think I would have made this much. But if you know anything about CPMs and RPMs on YouTube, they fluctuate like crazy and they give you no explanation why you can use your intuition and try to figure out what might be causing it. Sometimes it's video length. Sometimes it's, you know, Christmas. just the content in and of itself. Yeah. Or mm -hmm. <laughs> the time of year. Um, and yeah, it just, it didn't happen. And so I was like, oh man, like that, that really stinks. Um, and during that time I was pretty vocal and I fought it pretty hard, which was mostly just to show people that I cared enough, um, that I wanted to fight it. Not that I thought YouTube was going to text their CEO and have him get on the phone with me and be like, I would like to apologize on behalf of Google um, and myself and offer you a hundred thousand dollar check to say, we're sorry that didn't happen. That would have been sick. But what did happen was I got reached out to by a guy at USA swimming. And he said, Hey, we're doing this thing. We're launching this thing. I love what you're doing. We think it's a good thing for the sport. And we want to figure out if we can help you during this time. And then also, you know, have you kind of tie into this thing that we're doing? And I was like, yeah, <laughs> that sounds great. Um, and so it was a, a really long process. I was the first person that was brought on as their uh, first, uh, what's it called? Content provider. <laughs> we went mm -hmm. through like a ton of different name uh, iterations for that and a ton of different legal stuff. So I'm their first content provider, which means that I provide content for the USA Swimming Network and have my own channel on the USA Swimming Network. Um, and so, I mean, that means that I get a little bit of extra funding um, to create videos and let them use my videos on that channel to beef up their content offering, which if you think about it, it kind of comes back to full circle. They want layers on their channel as mm -hmm. well. They have mm -hmm. all the race footage. They have all the race footage, all of that. They mm -hmm have some content, they create their own content, but they don't have the resources in house to create like, nor do I think they really want to create seven different YouTube channels with seven different like individual brands. They'd rather say, you're putting more eyeballs on this sport. Let's figure out how to work together in some capacity. And we'll see you like what things we can do to help your content get better to help you put more butts in seats at Olympic mm -hmm. trials. I mean, if you're looking at it, it it's a pretty obvious move, right? Yeah. It's a, mm -hmm. listen, we want to sell tickets and you're kind of doing a job that we've been hoping people would do for a long time. We've had to sit here and watch it happen in track. We've had to try to figure out why it's not happening in swimming. Now that it's finally happening, we want to show people that we're going to jump all over it. And mm -hmm. my, whole thing with this really from the, the get go talking to them was, yeah, it'll be great to have a little bit more funding so I can kind of take a step back and say, maybe this can be a completely full-time thing at some point in time. Not that if someone asked me to do like 
a marketing contract for them. I have a marketing background. I would probably be like, yeah, I can, you know, I'll do that. I I'd, I'd like to make money because then I can buy a third microphone that I'll put in my closet and <laughs> still use just this one. Um, but on top of that, I realized that the people that have followed me, the people that have watched me, I've seen some of the people that have followed me for a long time, start their own Twitter account or start their own YouTube channel. And that's like the validation is I want to be kind of the catalyst for layers to start developing. And so I was like, if I sign a deal with USA swimming and I've turned down so many, I'm sure y'all have as well. So many partnership opportunities <laughs> and paid videos and stuff with like a cracker company from China. And I'm yeah. like, I'll take a free sample. <laughs> but <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to create content because my audience would just be like, what, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. Like, why are you peddling this to us? So I was like, I'm going to wait. And so when USA Swimming came up, I was like, this could be seriously validating for a kid that has always wondered if when he stops swimming, he or she stops swimming, they can continue working in the sport in some capacity. Because right now mm -hmm. when you graduate from the sport, you can coach. And about, yeah. That's, that's <laughs> an teach. intentional pause, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. You can yeah. coach and like maybe you can do some commentary if you're really lucky. Right. I look at commentary gigs and I have a couple. I'm really lucky to get to do that. Um, I look at them as like NFL kicking jobs. So if you follow mm -hmm. football, mm -hmm. kickers are like the ideal position for someone that wants a long, relatively easy career, easy on the body. Right. Because mm -hmm. you have like Adam Vinatieri kicked for like, what, 24 years. And so there's 32 or 34, 36 teams. I'm showing to everyone that I'm not a true NFL fan by not knowing like <laughs> half 32. of this stuff. Maybe I <laughs> used the wrong example, um, but they kick for so long. So none of those jobs ever open up. So if you think about Rowdy Gaines, he's been an Olympic commentator for a long time. Some people love him. Some people hate him. He has a job to do. And it's not talking to us, the three people on this podcast. It's talking mm -hmm. to people that have no idea what they're watching, but want to watch the Olympics and want to yell, go USA from home. Right. Mm -hmm. And so you have that job that is not going to be opened up for a long time. I hope Rowdy can do it until he's 185. It's really difficult to get a job when you quit swimming that is in swimming if it is not coaching or if you are not figuring out how to build more pools <laughs> or something mm -hmm. like that. So the goal is, yeah, I mean, develop layers of people that can stay within the sport. And then when they're 60 and they've built this cool media company, I'm not talking about me specifically, but maybe I am. And they're in a good spot because the community has helped build them up to be able to do that. Then they can say, I'm going to give back. I'm going to build a pool in the middle of the country, a really cool facility with 10,000 seats that can eventually be built to 50 where we can host the sickest championship meet, whatever here all the time. Don't even put my name on it. Put the, the handle of the company that got me here so that can grow even more. We can build a second one. You know, those layers and keeping money in the sport outside of just like, you know, you have a Speedo, you have a, mm -hmm. an arena, and those are sponsors and it's great. And you have Toyota, they're a sponsor and that's great. Figuring out how to layer up more of that. Like I graduated from swimming. Maybe I can start a YouTube channel. Mm. And this mm. dude kind of like laid out the groundwork for how it could work. I'm just going to write that out on a whiteboard, check the boxes as I go. And then hopefully eventually I can build a stadium right next to his stadium. That's twice <laughs> as big. <laughs> So with your with your deal then, do you have access to all of the footage filmed by other USA swimming colleagues and then you're able to then do, I don't know, race reviews, race analysis on your own channel, which then goes over to the network as well? Yeah, so I'm I'm pretty sure I could do like I could put a, a little picture in picture of me next to mm. a race that USA Swimming owns and just sit there and like just watch the race and not say a word and I could put it up on USA Swimming's network and they would be oh. like, Yeah, that's kinda of funny. On YouTube, you're dealing with Google and you're dealing with YouTube, not necessarily yeah. USA Swimming, because one of the best parts was during the demonetization thing, which I think really went back to YouTube and Google not understanding swimming enough to understand why content would be transformative, was they reached out and they were like, we disagree 100% with this happening. We watch your content and we watch you use our footage to help 
grow our audience and we love it. And it made me like mm -hmm. even more upset <laughs> because I was like, oh, man. there's no way to get through to YouTube to tell them like they disagree with you and I'm using their content and you're deciding that I'm doing this when the person that owns it and it's, it just gets really confusing. So mm -hmm. I, I definitely could use their content. It's just still a, a tricky world on YouTube and one that, you know, if I really, really, really want to grow this channel, I need to play by YouTube's rules a little bit. And then mm. on the USA swimming side of things, I can play by whatever rules I want, essentially <laughs> <laughs> within reason, obviously. That sounds good. <laughs> yeah. So you say you're, you're proud of creating these transformative moments of yourself and you, you've, it almost sounds like you're almost getting to that like pinch me moment of how this content creation has gone. But something that's very different between what you do and what me and Dan do is your names to it and your faces to it. Like me, yes, me and Dan appear on a podcast and we appear in videos and people now recognize us at pools. How tough is it sometimes to put your face out there to these, these moments and these moments in time in swimming? Because there's a lot of hate in swimming. That's, that's what I've oh. learned from running a YouTube channel and a podcast that you see the hate more than you see the love. Yeah, you're right. Um, it, it's definitely difficult uh, because people have, especially because I'm from the U.S. and I am an alumni of Arizona State, right? So I have two immediate biases and I have this like internal battle where I'm like, do I have to be unbiased and should I be unbiased? Mm. And I think really what has like grown this is the fact that I don't really care what people think. I don't really care, you know, if they notice that I'm, you know, biased towards the U S because God forbid I was, I was born in the U S and <laughs> know a lot of the guys and girls that are swimming on the team. Mm. Oh man, it's terrible. Right. I, I don't want to get a text from, you know, somebody on the team and me being like bashing them because I wanted to look unbiased. Right. And so it's the same thing with the NCAA. I kind of have that like, battle where I want to be unbiased to an extent in my coverage. I want to cover everybody that I think deserves it. But what comes with that is definitely some negative opinions and some negative voices that it's been a long learning experience to say the least, trying to disassociate people not liking my opinions on swimming and people not liking me. And it it's, I still don't it's think I'm not out on easy. that one. Yeah, it's um <laughs> it's something that, you know, I hope eventually just becomes easy and I've listened to a lot of really really big, you know, podcasters and just celebrities go on, which I'm not saying that I am one at all. Maybe at some point I, it will be, you know, annoying for me to say that I am not and it'll seem like the over humility that we tend to do a lot in swimming, but right now I still do not feel like I am that big. And so I deal with like these micro situations that can definitely eat me up. And so I'll listen to these podcasts and I can't remember who it was that was talking about it, but they'll, they'll give out really good advice on trying to just be yourself. And once you realize that, you know, it doesn't really matter what people in the comment section say, as long as you continue to cut through the noise and be your own person, be your own personality, easier said than done. <laughs> definitely easier said than done. Um, but yeah, there's, there's a ton of negativity that comes with it. I mean, I made the video about, um, who won the world championships when team USA <laughs> was given the trophy, literally yeah. given the trophy that said you won. <laughs> and I was like, uh, who really won, which coming from someone from the United States, right. Mm. Who signed a deal with the team USA swimming mm. to say, I'm going to make a video that might combat that a little bit and also kind of calls out world aquatics and says like, why doesn't anyone know? Why doesn't anyone agree? Is this the right scoring system? Will the U S ever not win this? And then have the <laughs> comment section be flooded with people from Australia yelling at me, telling me that I'm a biased American. When I basically said that I thought Australia won, <laughs> they probably um, didn't get that far. They, they just, didn't. Yeah. They, oh, they, they look at the title. straight away. <laughs> no, no shot. Yeah. yeah. They commented within three seconds of watching the video. I kind of wish that when you commented, it commented the time that you oh, also cool. commented yeah. at. And it also like maybe next to it commented the amount of the video that you watched. So that way, if someone commented something mean and they didn't want to make it look like they didn't watch the whole video, they would have to sit there and give you watch time. 
to talk shit. <laughs> yeah. I think that would be incredible. <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, it's, I've had a couple situations recently um, since I put my face on camera and my voice on camera where I swam at a meet um, in Austin and I hadn't been to a swim meet in a really long time. So I don't really go to a lot of swim meets. I'll go to meets mm. like in Austin, like UT swim meets and some ASU swim meets when I'm out in Arizona, excuse me. Um, and I'll get recognized a couple times at those. Uh, like when I did big 12 commentary, I mean, that's, that's kind of my audience is like the NCAA swimmers. Um, they, you know, I had a lot of people come up and, and say hi. And some people that I had talked about online came up and introduced themselves. And I was like, sorry if I said something mean, <laughs> um, <laughs> but I had a moment where I went to this meet and I was on the phone with my buddy who was in there. Cause I, I had a feeling that I was going to like, at least have a, a larger number of people come up to me during this meet. People need to realize it's something that you don't understand how to do. Mm. You don't understand how to, how to have a conversation with someone that you don't know, but they think they know you. And that's not a bad thing at all. But when someone gets to sit there and listen to you all the time, it's really easy to feel like they know you, but you don't know them. You don't mm. know their name. You don't know their times. You don't know any of that. Right? So it's a thing that I'm learning to do. And it's the thing that in that moment I had to learn how to do because I was walking in the gate and I looked through the gate as I was trying to find my friend and there were, there's a group of 10 kids just standing there. And I was like, Oh, it's a swimmy. Like, that's fine. And then they were all just staring at me <laughs> and I was like, Oh, <laughs> that's for me. <laughs> and so I walked in the gate and like talked to all of them and it was great. Um, and then throughout the rest of the meet, I probably met like 30 to 40 people, um, and yeah, I mean, it's, there's so much good and there's so much bad. Um, mm -hmm. but I mean, the, the good is getting to meet those kids and you know, the video of my race that my girlfriend took where I died, like died <laughs> the last 20 meters, there was a group of like six kids behind her talking about me while I raced and like explaining what I do to other kids. And it was like one of those moments where I was like, like, yeah, okay, hopefully that kid will go to college and then graduate college and keep watching content and stay engaged with the sport because of mm -hmm. what he just saw right now. And because mm -hmm. he saw a kid that's a kid, <laughs> a grown man that's 29 <laughs> years old swimming in a meet just because why not to create content to keep people engaged, you know, planting those seeds right now is, is hugely mm -hmm. important, but good and bad internet, mostly bad <laughs> in person, <laughs> mostly good. Yeah. Yeah. I was gonna say that in person interactions we have at swim meets, I've got no problem at all. Like if anyone's listening, mm -hmm. Come yeah, it, it's just us. weird, it's, right? It's just like a little bit like I, just, I don't know how to explain it. I'll be honest. I think we, our, our, we started our... this adventure to build a platform for other swimmers and yes. other people. Yeah. In no way yeah. did I build a platform for people to meet me. It's just a, a it's a consequence of what we've done. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah, a consequence is a good word too. It has some negative connotation to it, but it's like mm. a you didn't go into it thinking that this was going to happen, yeah. right? Mm. I got recognized at a restaurant one time and I was like, this, and it was in front of my girlfriend at the time. And I was like, what do you, what do you think about that? How, how cool is that? Right. <laughs> and, um, I had a moment where I was like, huh? Like I, I never expected to get recognized ever in my entire life outside mm. of in a pool in a pool area or at like a swimming convention or something like that. And, you know, then it made me think of like guys that do NFL commentary, like a Joe Buck. You've got a guy mm. that does commentary, does exactly what I do that likely cannot leave the house and go do something normal without getting talked to. So it's like, yeah, man, maybe swimming does blow up and, and that becomes a part of my life. And it's like that changes your daily life and, at some point, if you think about Taylor Swift, and this is why I said consequence was a good word, she can't do a thing. <laughs> no. She can't do a thing without 10 security guards are getting wheeled out of an NFL game in a popcorn container because they got to hide her from all of her crazy fans. Not crazy. I don't want to get attacked by the, the Swifties, <laughs> but <laughs> don't want to bring that on, on your podcast. Um, but yeah, it's, it's an interesting thing. I love meeting people. I love it. The first couple of times it happened to me, I probably looked like the most socially awkward person on the planet because it's like a learned skill. It definitely is yeah. talking to people that know you that you don't really know them is a learned skill. And I think I've gotten a lot better at it. Hopefully I have. 
if you see me in person, come say hi. If I sound like an awkward idiot, it's because I'm I'm out of shape. I haven't been to a swim meet in a minute. Yeah, because one, one of the meets we went to this summer, I think it was, uh, I actually had to sign an autograph. And I'm like... I'm not. I'm not. I used to swim, yes, but I'm nowhere near the level of let's say, Adam or like, <laughs> what is going on. I actually don't know what's going on right now. Having photos, like I'm not the the guy you're supposed to be here to see. You know, the guy's in the pool over there. That's what you should be seeing. And so it's trying to get used mm. to that. I think, which uh, is bizarre. And I think we're still learning every meet that we go to. We still have people come over, and uh, it is. It's great and. It's great that they're fans of the channel, but we need them to be fans of swimming first, and then you know you can say hello to us afterwards. You know, but uh, yeah, there you go. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it, it's those layers, right? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. We're we're a layer, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> which, which kind of sounds like very like plain, <laughs> but we are we're a layer. And one thing that I've kind of struggled with is allowing that to happen because there is an element of doing what we do that makes you feel like you shouldn't be allowed that attention or you shouldn't be signing autographs or you shouldn't be taking photos because of what's going on in the pool. And mm. that's something that I've battled a lot because mm. even when I'm, you know, I was at that meet and I was getting run down by a, a 15 year old, the hundred brushstroke run down by him. And then he went and found me in the warm down pool and was like, like, Hey, and I was like, <laughs> Dude, when you are 22, you're going to be beating me by 10 seconds in that race. <laughs> and it's like just disassociating yourself from, and mm. swimmers do this all the time, having to be a 58-second long course 100 breaststroker to be cool or to be recognized or to sign an autograph or to do any of that stuff. Disassociating that is like, I think it's hugely important in developing those layers. You know, mm -hmm. having cool personalities that don't have to be fast. Because right now, the only way to be, you know, especially monetarily successful in swimming is to break a world record, to win eight gold medals, to win you know, or to get the Olympic tattoo. And that's that's really it. Or, you know, be an incredible coach. Obviously, that's that's a huge part of our sport as well. I don't want to gloss over them. But those are the ways to be successful. Adding another layer of success and adding another layer of jobs and adding another, another layer of, you know, potential income post swimming and allowing that interaction between fans because they are fans mm. and disassociating ourselves with the fact that we don't have to be a 58 second hundred breaststroker. And I am never going to be a 58 second hundred <laughs> breaststroker, I think is, is important, but equally as difficult to do. Mm. Yeah. hundred yeah. percent. Now we, we've covered a lot, a lot of layers on this podcast. <laughs> and we, I think we were going to touch upon American swimming, but you know what I might do? We might save that for another podcast in the future leading into mm. American trials. We Let's might do have it. Another podcast, but yeah, I'll come uh, on whenever you guys want. We could do 100%. seven, eight, nine different podcasts if you guys want to. <laughs> Sounds good to me. But in in the meantime, then between now and our next podcast, what's the plan for Kyle? What what's coming up? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, I've got some things written out on the whiteboard. Um, I, I'm not like a hundred percent sure. I have some ideas, and I have some really, really big ideas that down the line, I want to be able to get to the, the main idea and the main thing this season. And if you're this season talking about NCAA swimming, if you're listening to this and you follow NCAA swimming and you're an American swimming, you can hold me to it is I really want to aggressively elevate the NCAA swimming coverage that I do and especially try to bring a level of professionalism to the content that I put out and pair that with kind of the human nature that I bring to coverage of the sport. So for a while, um, I think I, and I don't think it's a bad thing. I don't think it's like necessarily wrong. I leaned into the, not lackadaisical, but the, the human tone and allowed myself to just kind of like throw stuff around and get some things wrong and have that be okay and have typos and reply to myself and be like, oopsie, you know, stuff like that. So trying to bring, and kind of create a marriage between professionalism in the components that should be professional and a cadence. So like every single Friday we do this, every single Wednesday we do this and starting to really treat what I do as a business mm -hmm. is, is the next layer. Um, I don't know if you wanted me to go that, you know, deep into like the schedule and like what's on my whiteboard, <laughs> um, but <laughs> trying to bring like a layer of professionalism into the coverage and, you know, definitely during NCAAs do a, a dry run of what I would like 
2024 Paris, you know, to look like. Mm -hmm. Um, and maybe I'll be in Paris. I won't be swimming unless I do figure out how to go 58 seconds in a hundred breaststroke. And as it looks right now, that, that would probably make the team in the U S (laughs) um, but yeah, so, I mean, just to professionalize things and, and try to get things more repetitive, um, and build the expectation of when things are happening and build, you know, Mm -hmm. a consistent audience that is waiting for a piece of content to come out is kind of the next phase. Um, and then on top of that, I'm doing a 200 butterfly for time and jeans. Just for fun. I don't know if it's necessarily for fun, but got to pay the bills. Is this this in yards as well? This will be in yards, yeah. Uh, Only because in meters, I don't think I could finish it. Long course, (laughs) short course meters, I could finish it because you get a little bit of time. But the fourth fifty long course, Mm. I think, I think would actually kill me wearing jeans. You'll be vertical, I think, more than horizontal. <laughs> I think I'd be on the on the lane rope vertical, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> be holding yeah. on to it. But I've got the jeans. Um, I think I've got the pool figured out. That's that's probably gonna be and the thing that scares me about that is I have the thumbnail mapped out, and this is actually breaking news. I've never I haven't told anybody that I'm doing this yet, outside of the people that directly know about it. The thing that terrifies me is thinking about the thumbnail and thinking about the title. I'm thinking about the content that is likely going to come out of this 200 butterfly. I think that video is going to perform very well. And if it performs very well, (laughs) that comment section is going to be full of kids telling me to do a 400 IM in a sweatshirt or Uh. (laughs) a mile in (laughs) like knee high socks or something. And that could become my new workout plan. It's just going to be three (laughs) days a week doing some ridiculously (laughs) challenging thing like a 50 freestyle and cowboy boots to, to help promote the Austin rodeo professional swim team. I'll tell you what, if uh, that becomes the case, we'll uh, send you over a bucket because it might be <laughs> regularly. <sighs> <sighs> yeah, probably. <laughs> well, I, I, mean, I think the 200 fly might, might do it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, most likely. <laughs> Carl, it's been so much fun having a chat with you. There's been so many, I don't know, conversations that I think we've never had about what we mm. put out and what you put out is, is really good to be transparent about these things and something we try our best to do. And I'm glad you are too. Um, best of luck with the USA Swimming Network deal. I'm really excited to see what comes out of that because I think content can just keep pushing each other on, mm. whether that's we need to get to your level. Um, I'm looking forward to it. It's a challenge mm. that is needed in the space. And um yeah, it's been great chatting. And yeah, like you said, we will definitely do this again. Yeah, we'll do it again on, on my podcast soon too. I've got, uh, yeah, some, I've got some gaps. Let's uh, <laughs> let's figure it out. Well, we're looking forward to your NCAA uh, coverage. And if that all goes well, then you never know what happens in Paris. That would be mm. quite incredible, really. So yeah, best of luck for all of it. And we will definitely chat again soon. You've been listening to the Propulsion Swimming Podcast with Scott and Dan. We want to thank you for joining us and invite you to subscribe to the show as well as checking out the Propulsion Swimming YouTube channel for weekly tutorials and videos to get your swimming fix. We will be back next week. Until then, we'll catch you on the next one.